No problem. Are we on? Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for Thank tuning you in. For tuning I'm so in. excited to be here once again with you. Um, um, this is all about when school is hard. And my name is Patty Fraser, and I am the team leader of the uh, Intensive Mental Health School Services Program here at Linwood. And I'm here with my colleague, Selena, and I'll let Selena introduce herself. Hello, Selena. Hi, everyone. My name is Selena Busink, and I'm a clinician here at Linwood Charlton Center. And we're really excited to bring you this presentation tonight, When School is Hard. Excellent. Okay, make sure you guys, if you have any questions or comments or you want to chat in, please do. Um, let's make this a really informal, interactive discussion. Okay, so um, just before I get into the content, I do want to just make sure that I'm declaring this a safe place for us to chat and talk about some of these uh, school difficulties. Um, it can be a really difficult subject, and anytime mental health uh, is in the topic of discussion, we want to make sure that people are feeling safe and we're all standing up to the stigma. Uh, so, my first slide here is all about integrating perspectives. And when we have a home and a school team, um, usually by the time they get to service, uh, we notice that there's a big strain in this relationship and it's the first thing that has to be repaired. Um, oftentimes, um, when there is damage between the home and school relationship, the child is the one who is impacted the most. Uh, this can create lots of confusion for the child, um, not really knowing who to align with. So the ideal treatment and the number one evidence-based um, thing on our list is to address this relationship. So we really need to be aware of the family's existing perspective of the child um, at home and in the community. Um, we really believe that our parents are experts on their children um, and it's really important to have their view um, close and upfront. Um, now the school also has an existing perspective of that child in the classroom because they see them for a different part of the day and the child uh, student typically looks different when they're in the classroom. So it's really important to merge these two uh, and come up with an integrated view of the child. Um, definitely using strengths um, to highlight um, the things that are going to help that child succeed in school. And with this emerging perspective, uh, we know that that's going to position our children to be the most successful learners. So uh, effective partnerships are all about assertiveness and good communication skills. So this is really, really key. Okay, so the other thing we really wanna do, I think I skipped ahead too fast there, is we really want to have a good understanding of what the school difficulties consist of. Um, it's very important to understand that there are so many layers to what be, could be going on with your child um, in the classroom. And these consist of and are not limited to things like trauma, learning disabilities, motor issues, sensory sensitivities, social anxiety, poor social skills, academic insecurity, low self-esteem, and any kind of mental health diagnoses. So in taking a good look at um, what's going on for your child in the classroom, uh, consists of, take, uh, of considering all of these things and how your child is actually uh, communicating to you. And most times we notice in the classroom that the first thing we see is behavior. And this behavior can um, sometimes look really off-putting and um, can be very misconstrued and misunderstood by uh, the school personnel or um, the teacher or other students, and sometimes even at home. So we, we want to really kind of capture a good understanding that's based in um, what we know is going on for that child and kind of surrounded in strengths, so it remains uh, strength focused. Um, we want to also think about how we want the school um, to see our child and um, 
what are the kinds of things we want to put at the top of the list for them to be understanding the behavior that they see every day. I hope that uh, kind of makes sense to people. So overall, one of the, the biggest things that is important to do for a child who is struggling at school is really working on building resiliency. There are so many things that could go wrong at school, and I'm sure as parents tuning in, you've already experienced a lot of these things. Um, and they can be very upsetting to our students and, and children coming home with um, lots of stories and lots of struggles. And so we want to position our children to be able to bounce back as quickly as they can. And that requires us as parents to really take a look at um, the kinds of things that we're modeling for our students, for our children at home. So um, there's so many different styles of teaching, so many different styles of interacting at the school level that not every child is going to um, respond to the same kind of teacher. And so it's important for your children to understand that some teachers do raise their voice. Some teachers might not um, teach the way, the, the best way in which your child can take that information in. And so we work that out. But as we work that out, it's important for us to teach our children that there is a way to problem solve through this stuff. And your children are looking to you guys um, to show them how to solve the problem without losing their cool. And um, it's really important to understand that as a parent, you're being watched all the time, how you're managing some of the school stuff. Um, so that's why we want to model the best possible resiliency to our children. Do we have a, we're good? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, so let's talk about um, advocacy for a second here, because this is um, something that takes on a huge role for parents. Um, sometimes as children who are struggling in school, they very typically don't have the words to talk about what's going on for them. So it's important for us as parents to capture all of the things that we know about our, our children, how they learn, what gets in the way, what are the kinds of things that maybe trigger them to not be at their best at school every day, what are the kinds of things that do put them at ease and make them um, or help them to find their calm learning brain. So all of those details are really, really, really important to capture somewhere. So I've got a picture here. I'm going to try and use my little tools because I'm learning how to do these webinars. I'm going to take my little tool here. So over here, we've got um, what we call an individual education plan, which you guys may have heard of. Um, certainly, it is something used in our school board here in the Hamilton-Wentworth uh, district area. And that should cover um, any kind of learning issues that are going on for your child. And um, if there is a need for an individual education plan, it should highlight the strategies that already work. And it's really important for these IEPs to be up to date and actually actually meaningful. So I would encourage all parents to be a part of that IEP planning and make sure that you're reviewing it on a yearly basis. Um, they're looking for a signature, so don't just throw the signature down there, but get to know it. And again, it's a place for you to advocate for what works and what doesn't work for your child. Um, over here, We've got um, something that we use here at the agency, but that can be really adapted to anyone, and it's called a school support plan. And it really encompasses all of the strengths of the student uh, because we know how important it is to highlight the good things, um, especially for self-esteem reasons and for that, just to help that child feel better about who they are as a student. And we can also highlight mental health concerns, uh, what are some of the things, are, what is our current understanding of that child and that student, uh, why they do some of the things that they do, what their behavior is trying to tell you, and how to uh, get the best out of that student. And then um, this is one of my favorite little pictures here because it's just a reminder that when you are advocating and you're doing this work for your child, 
that you definitely catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So it's really important for us to maybe put some of our frustrations aside and really play nice in the sandbox. And that can be very difficult. But again, when we go back to our, um, our alignment and making sure that home and school relationship is uh, in really good shape, the child benefits from that. So you can certainly have disagreements with the school. You can certainly feel frustrated with the school. But again, you're being watched and it's important for you to model how to work through those issues in a really uh, pro-social and pro-positive way. So um, any of the behavior that comes up for students, um, we want to try again and reframe the behavior. So we want to have an understanding of the behavior as opposed to highlighting how negative the behavior can be. Um, one of the strategies, uh, I did a webinar not so long ago, um, and one of the parents talked about having a, a well put together binder over here and they suggested that you keep all of the students' information in one place. So when you go into meetings or you go in to advocate, you've got it in one place. And I loved the idea that they actually put the student's picture on the front cover to remind people of how absolutely adorable that student is, no matter what behavior they're exhibiting. Um, so I thought that was a really kind of nice strength-based way of capturing who this student patty really is. So there's some good ideas there if you want to get your stuff together and be the best advocate you can be. All right, so I talked a little bit about reframing behavior problems. Um, so you might hear words like manipulative. He or she is lazy. He can do it, he just doesn't want to try. Um, talking about defiance and aggression. aggression attention seeking and they're doing it on purpose. These are all kind of buzz phrases that are concerning because we never want to trap our children into these kinds of labels. We want to again try and understand it from a different point of view. So it's important for you to understand that children will do well if they can. They strive to do well and they really really want um, to be at their best. Um, I'm going to pause for a second because I believe we have some questions. Just looking for the question. There it is. Uh, Patty, it says, can a student who is not identified use an IEP? Um, yes, they're act they actually can. Now, the best... Um, I think the, the best practice is to actually have an identification, but it is not necessarily um, necessary because there might be a lot of things, um, or a student might come with a lot of um, criteria that need to be considered in their learning. And just because there's not an actual um, identification or a learning disability that's been identified, but perhaps maybe they're still exhibiting some behavior or there's still um, some real challenges to their learning, an IEP can be used. Um, there's different, um, different ways to go about that in the, different, uh, in the public board and the Catholic board, uh, but any learner at school who needs extra supports can be identified um, to, uh, to benefit from an IEP. Okay, good question. All right, so when we're reframing behaviors, we want to keep in mind, here's this cute little excerpt that hits home with me. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Um, so, you know, that really kind of highlights that we need to understand our children and our learners and how they do best. If we have an expectation of them, that really doesn't fit with their capabilities, then they're going to internalize that as their problem and it's their fault and perhaps maybe they're not good enough. So we really have to uh, be aware of the student's profile. Um, yes, sir. All right, now we have a poll question. Um, again, looking at, oh, 
There it is. So the question is, what is the most misunderstood characteristic of your child as a student? Um, the list here, these are all common things that uh, we hear about uh, get in the way of understanding their children. So I'm really interested to see what you guys have to say. Okay, so academic ability just skyrocketed, but now it seems to be balancing out. Interesting. I don't do math very well, so I'm going to rely on my, my team here. Okay, so we've got uh, mental health 50%, which does not surprise me at all. We know that one in five people in Canada will um, experience some kind of mental health um, concern over their lifetime. And when you think about that in the classroom, that's five kids out of 30 um, who are experiencing mental health issues and very little um, training going on um, for kids uh, dealing with mental health in the, in the schools. So we've also got academic ability at 40%. Uh, again, uh, sometimes when we have a better understanding of how that student learns and their learning uh, profile, that makes a big difference in understanding some of the behavior that they exhibit. So thank you very much for uh, doing that. Okay. All right, so um, collaboration. So this is another really important factor when you're working with a homeschool team. Um, you need to present as united. Um, you need to align and join the team and work together as hard as that can be. You're not always going to agree with the teacher or the school administration. Uh, that's just the way it is. However, for your child's benefit, it's really important to have a good communication plan in place and again to play nice in that sandbox so you're modeling good problem solving skills. So you want to streamline your communication, find the best way that works. Who do you speak to? Who is the ally in your school? Can you email them daily? Can you have a phone conversation at the end of the week? Get a plan down so you know exactly when you're going to be commuting with, communicating with the school because that also benefits your child to have adult to adult uh, conversations so um, the child knows that you guys are united. So consistent messages from home and school. For the most part, you want to be uniting the message that school is the most important thing and they, their learning is the most important thing and success at school is very, very important. Um, you also want to make sure that um, everything that you're deciding with the school team is in the child's best interests. So you're not necessarily trying to um, figure out who's right and who's wrong between home and school if there's a disagreement, but you're really focusing on what is the problem here and what do we really need to come to terms with for the child's best interests. Uh, and of course, everything we do, we want to consider the child and the student's point of view as well um, and incorporate that whenever we can. So collaboration is certainly where it's at. All right, a few more things here. Oh, this is when I get to use my drawing tool, but I'm not sure where the draw. Oh, there it is. Okay, so here just another um, way of showing you that the student needs to be Number one, so look at me writing this here. Student, oh, I can even do cursive writing. Maybe I'm having too much fun for you guys, but this is great. Okay, so we want it student focused, right? And we use a triangle because a triangle is nice and strong and it holds each other up, each of the walls. And at its foundation, we want the parent and the family to be supporting. Cursive writing not working so much now. I've kind of lost it. Parent. Okay, and over here we want this to be the community. Any other community services that collaborate or help the child be their best. This could be a church, it could be a recreation center, it could be a sport they're involved in. And then over here we've got the school of course. Okay, so next time I might not use cursive when learning, but not too bad, eh? I think you guys get the idea. So it's a nice strong triangle and it's very student focused. 
that was that was way too much fun. Okay, one more question for you guys before I hand it over to Selena. We're really interested in knowing who right now is satisfied with the with the school support plan that they have in place right now. Um, we just want to get a sense of how much work is there to do out there and how much of this outreach um, education do we need to do with our schools to make sure that we have the best supports in place. Um, so I'm seeing a pretty high number on the no, I don't have a solid plan at 75%. So we've got some work to do. Um, I encourage you to be part of that work. You guys are number one in your children's lives and um, your kids are gonna follow your lead and they want to know that you've got it covered. Uh, so I hope that um, that helped you with some overall tips, um, some general tips on how to work closely with your school and to highlight the strengths of your, um, your child so they can be the best student that they can be. So Selena's gonna get into some more specific information um, about what we see uh, quite a bit of. And um, before I hand it over to you, I will just pause for any questions um, that you have concerning the things that I just spoke about. Why are learning disabilities not tested until grade two? Am I reading that correctly? That is a really, really great question. Um, it's felt that, first of all, there's, there's a real minimum resource on who can do um, testing for learning disabilities. And sometimes it takes um, a longer time to see a pattern of uh, disruptive behavior or a pattern of um, learning difficulties that emerge um, through the years and at grade two it just isn't quite as uh, clear yet. Uh, teachers may have somebody flagged or already be identifying that there's something amiss um, but they get their best results at a later age and when the child is stable. Um, if there's a lot of behavior getting in the way and that child is not able to perform on the test then oftentimes the results um, are not clear or they're considered to be um, uh, not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, lost my word. Um, results are not, somebody help me out here. What's the word? Confirmed, just because they're not in a stable place. Um, so the later they do it, the better, although, you know, we would like to know earlier because we know early prevention is the best way to go. Uh, any other questions? If you can direct me, thank you. What do you do with a teenager? How do you change attitudes when they have already been years of labeling? So one of the, that's oh, the very, very frustration. I can hear frustration in that question. Um, one of the things that we do right away is not only align with, um, with the school, and, and to get a good homeschool team going, we also really need to get our youth committed to the process as well. And that takes a lot of validating, a lot of um, helping them understand that they're not a bad person and uh, they don't fit into those negative labels. There's reasons why they're struggling with their learning. And so the more we can get them involved um, in advocating for themselves and problem solving, the better. Okay. Uh, why are learning disabilities? Oh, okay, got that one. All right. I think that's it for now. And uh, I will hand it over to Selena. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, so to start off, let's talk about school refusal. Okay. How's the volume now? Should I turn it down a bit? This is good? Okay. All right. So school refusal behavior refers to youth who've had difficulties attending classes or remaining in school. And prior to this definition, other terms were commonly used, such as truancy, non-attender, school phobia, or school avoidance. 
And a lot of these terms are still used today, but overall in the current literature in this specific area, the accepted term to refer to youth who have difficulty remaining in school due to either social, emotional, or psychological difficulties is referred to school refusal. So this behavior is often viewed along a whole spectrum that includes youth who miss long periods of time in school, miss sporadic periods of time in school, or skip classes, or maybe arrive late to school, um, maybe even display severe morning misbehaviors in an attempt to refuse school and not go, or attend school with really a great deal of dread and somatic complaints that uh, might cause pleas for future non-attendance. So laying down the groundwork for discussion around school refusal is not isolated to the youth who's not attending. It really includes the family variable. Evidence uh, suggests that school absences are you know, sometimes reinforced by the benefits of staying home, such as parental attention, free time, and respite from academic and social challenges. So when we look at the current structure of our academic system for children and youth, we could see that a lot of time is spent in education institutions of some sort. In Ontario, typically from the age of three and a half to late adolescence, children and youth are expected to be in some, some form of school environment. That is a lot of time to expect all children to participate willingly. We live in a society that values education, especially since education is needed to attain employment. But school experiences are different for everyone, and it is important to acknowledge that some of these experiences are negative for some youth. It'd be quite the challenge to create a school environment that's perfect for every learning style, every temperament, and every personality. So it is by no surprise that there will be those who fall through the cracks. What I hope we can try and convey during this session is that there is help, there are supports available, and that educational programs are essentially created with good intentions. The ultimate goal of any educational program is keeping students engaged and present in school to ensure that they are receiving the education that they need. And furthermore, in cases of school refusal, school personnel must be you know, cognizant of the need to support the emotional well-being of their students. So why are ch children and youth refusing to go to school? So there is, evidences, there is evidence that absences are often driven by overlapping individual, medical, family, and social factors, and that frequent absences are often driven definitely by more than one factor. It is important to note that anxiety is often a factor in frequent absences, and even if other factors such as chronic illnesses are also present, Anxiety seems to be a big one. So for example, a student may have academic or social problems at school that leads to anxiety that causes him or her to stay home due to a stomach ache. So who, who's refusing school? So when it comes to school refusal, it really can be anyone and can be present in any population. Research shows that youth who refuse school are represented fairly equally among gender, racial, and income groups. So it can impact anybody. Youth who exhibit school refusal behaviors have a range of both internalizing and externally, externalizing types of behavior challenges, such as diagnoses of depression, anxiety, various somatic complaints, aggressive tendencies, and exhaustion. In many cases, school refusal behavior is in conjunction with some mental disorders, especially separation and generalized anxiety disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, and depression. So it might be difficult for an adolescent or, or youth uh, to admit how they are feeling, and sometimes they can't, they can't always name it. So whether they are feeling anxious or sad or worried, it can be difficult to label the feeling that is their barrier for attending. Um, and anxiety and depression can be major contributors to a student's reluctance to go to school. Furthermore, the inability for an individual to identify the cause of these feelings doesn't make them any less real or harmful. So there are estimates that show that up to 28% of school-aged children are affected by anxiety-based school refusal. So here we have a very commonly used image that demonstrates the various stages of anxiety. There are healthy amounts of anxiety that all of us have, um, because certain levels of anxiety are very important for our survival. So for example, if we have no anxiety about crossing the road, we might not look both ways. 
And if we have too much anxiety, we might never cross the road at all. So having just that healthy amount of arousal can demonstrate peak performance, which is at the top of this graph. In school refusal behavior, we often see that the arousal levels are way too low or way too high, which leads to low level of performance. And in this example that we're talking about is not attending school at all. So with, without a surprise, um, another area that is documented to impact school attendance is bullying, which also includes cyberbullying. So it is difficult to navigate bullying because sometimes we don't know what is going on. The private life of a lot of youth is, is in fact private and we don't know what they're doing on social media. So try and ask your child or youth if they are impacted by bullying or bullying online. Be upfront with them and ask them. They're aware that you know that this is a common concern in our modern day culture and I think it's fair for you to ask. They might be embarrassed, but you let them know that you want to help them and find solutions to this problem. If you are concerned that a child is being bullied and that this may be causing school absenteeism, it may benefit the victimized student by encouraging them to alert a supportive adult at school or by offering to contact that person directly. You can contact a teacher that your child has good rapport with and help the youth build an ally that they can trust and go to when they need. This person might also be able to help navigate a plan for the youth and assist in how to best manage when things get difficult at school. So I'm told we have a question here. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, the question is, how many days do they need to miss before they are considered to be refusing school, or is it more about inconsistency? Oh, okay. So that's... Uh, Basically, two questions, um, a bit separate, because there are there is a magic number of days in, in which that a student would need to acquire a medical note as to why they're not attending. And offhand right now, Patty, is it 13 or 15? 15 days. 15 days. And that would be when um, the so social worker from that school would be uh, flagged, so that way that student... Um, their attendance record would be uh, checked out by the social worker and through school administration and families would be notified. Um, but there is the second part of this question, which is more about the inconsistency, because um, a lot of students who are sort of in this school refusal category are missing uh, maybe two out of the five days of the week or one out of the five and that could be problematic um, in terms of staying on top of things um, for academic work. Um, and the only reason why I even bring that up as being a value is because that could be a very high source of anxiety and stress when the workload gets piled, when a student gets so far behind that uh, attending school becomes even a, a bigger barrier because um, that mountain just keeps building. Okay. Patty, do you have anything to add to that? I was just going to say, um, sometimes we see a direct correlation between any kind of holidays, snow days, extra time off, and it's even that much more difficult for your child to get back into the game of going to school every day. Um, so they might be attending for a good solid two weeks, and then maybe there's an extra long weekend or a week's holiday in there, and getting back into the grind is really, really difficult. So that might be another clue um, that you might be dealing with some school refusal behavior. Um, Selena, I see that we have also another question for you. Um, so how do you help a younger child explain what they are anxious about um, so the issue can be addressed? Okay, so with the younger uh, population, it might be more difficult for them to really articulate what's going on for them. So, you know, using their language and I find that um, when the little guys come home from school and a parent says, what did you do to today and so many parents get frustrated because the child's response is often nothing um, because it's a hard question to answer. So if you um, you know strategize what your question would be and, um, and maybe consider uh, what part of your day was tough today or what part of your day um, made you miss home, uh, you might be able to pinpoint a little bit more directly uh, what a barrier could have been. Um, it could have been the recess period, it could have been um, the gym period, but uh, really trying to 
hone in on those questions uh, because if it's way too open and broad, um, you might just get the, the child who says nothing, everything's fine because they just want the conversation to be done. Absolutely. And another reason to have that um, homeschool communication in place. So you can check out um, with the teacher what are the times of day that seem particularly difficult and um, is there some emerging patterns here um, that uh, I can reflect on so I can figure out how to discuss that with my younger child? Sure. Good questions, guys. Thanks. Good questions. And that question actually leads us into our next slide, um, the what do we do uh, part. Um, so one of the key things to remember is try to intervene quickly. If you are starting to notice a pattern of school refusal or inconsistent attendance or um, the frequent morning stomach aches that you know, you know, ha have been medically ruled out as being anything in that area, um, it's, it's important to, to really approach this um, fairly rapidly because it can get more challenging when a youth gets way too accustomed to not attending. Um, so the approach we want to use is that we really want to be understanding. So talk to your child or youth and find out what is going on and be an active listener. Um, try to, you know, you know, sometimes we have to bite our tongue because we want to ask a billion questions, but allow them to tell you their story and, you know, really listen. Uh, sometimes asking an open-ended question like, you know, what is preventing you from getting out of bed in the morning or what can I do to help you? Um, we also want to be firm in our approach, uh, reminding your child that you want to help them and work with them and be consistent in this message that, you know, each day that they're struggling, you know, you're there for them in the way that uh, they might need you to be there. And we want to make sure that key players are involved who can help with the situation. So maybe a grandparent, an aunt, a neighbor, a friend. Uh, if your child uh, or youth has a really good rapport with someone who could be of a good help, it might be worth um, asking them for help or asking your child that, you know, the neighbor might, you know, come in and support this. And of course, having school staff involvement, so connecting with VPs, which are the vice principals, the guidance counselors, and social workers. Um, don't be afraid to include key players. Uh, don't be afraid to send out emails, make phone calls. The school would appreciate your involvement and appreciate the, your, your desire to approach this. Definitely find your allies. Because there are allies. a lot of them out there. There are a lot of people at your child's school who really, really do care about your child. Um, lots of different styles out there, lots of, lots of different observations. Of so that's really, really important to find the people who want to do uh, the best for your child. And then sometimes when a student has been out of school for a long time, going back could be a big challenge. So there are some strategies you can employ to work towards a smoother transition. So you can look at um, staying in connection with the school in, in terms of increasing the monitoring of the daily attendance uh, because we don't, we don't have truancy officers anymore. And when a student is missing school for several consecutive days, um, but not enough to meet that marker, it might be um, them falling through the cracks and you know missing prolonged absences, uh, but still not being flagged for supports. Um, and then also getting immediate feedback uh, back and forth between the school, back and forth, having a communication plan in place. And the required documentation for require, uh, legitimate absences, and that's where the medical note comes in play. Um, and the use of written attendance contracts that outline rewards and penalties for attendance and non-attendance, we don't typically call them contracts. We call them more of like a, a school support plan. So helping students feel supported in their um, reintegration back into the school. Some more um, intervention and reintegration styles and methods that might be useful for families and even for schools to employ would be uh, looking at uh, maybe resolving some challenges that might be between teachers and peers. As Patty had talked about earlier, not every teacher is the same and they might be, have a different style and delivery. So working with your youth and how to best navigate that. Um, looking at increased participation of your child and maybe some extracurricular activities that are socially appropriate so they could benefit from practicing 
some social skills in a safe and familiar environment. Uh, it could be soccer practice, karate, or in a youth group. Uh, consider what your child's former interests may have been. Maybe they used to be really involved in something, but that dissipated. So maybe finding a renewal in interest that uh, was once there and maybe foster that. Um, and then see if there are any additional learning needs that your child might need. And that would be part of that communication that you would have with the school to find out if maybe there's uh, some learning disabilities that you know need to be addressed because that could be the barrier as well that uh, you know the student might be struggling with the content of a subject but it would just be a matter of tweaking um, how it's delivered uh, in order for them to better understand. And then finally seeking support around accessing a appropriate and tailored instruction. So this might mean communicating with teachers ahead of time. So if a student has a presentation coming up and your child all of a sudden is missing several days of school because of the anxiety leading to this, it might be a value to work with the school around this and supporting your youth and advocating for themselves. I know Patty talked about adv advocacy a little bit too and that um, helping our youth speak up for themselves and finding their own voice and you know, we can't expect them to do that right off the hop. They might need our support to do that. Um, but over over time, with some practice, um, definitely that that could be something that uh, that they can do. And then we, do we have, have a, a question. Question, uh, question is: Who would be or who would do mediation with teachers or between students? Well, that's a good question. I talked earlier about finding your allies. Talked earlier your school. about finding your allies. Um, oftentimes, I find that um, people from the learning resource department are um, very equipped to deal with those kinds of situations. They have a really good understanding of um, some of the learners in the school and what might uh, be a barrier in order to problem solve and work through issues. Um, but any really caring adult in the school should be able to um, help mediate situations between um, students. If it's a high profile situation, then you want that student's team to be involved because you want it to be handled in the most respectful way. Um, and uh, typically, our students who are struggling might also struggle with low self-esteem. So we want to be careful that their feelings are validated. At the same time, the, the problem is being solved. Um, anything to add to that, Selena? No, that's great. That's a good question. Okay, now we're just going to skip forward to some of the challenges and barriers to interventions and supports. So perhaps the greatest um, challenge for youth who are experiencing school behavior is the treatment component. Uh, in particular, common challenges include deciding on a specific intervention that works, um, shifting gears if that plan is not effective, and being able to be flexible in how you know, you're dealing with your child. And another barrier and challenge could be is the competing viewpoints. Now, as much as we say there's allies out there, um, all these allies also have different opinions. So sometimes that could be something to factor in that when you're navigating this, the, it, it might be a challenge that you might have different opinions around the table um, on how to best uh, resolve this. Um, so, you know, working on the communication and, you know, with the goal of the youth at the center of the of sort of the purpose, that I think we'd get the best outcomes that way. Uh, another challenge is uh, dealing with non-compliance during intervention. So having, you know, some maybe having youth who aren't on board with this. And that's going to happen. And I think that's why we keep tweaking and rebuilding the plan and working towards the goal uh, that would best be suited for the student. Um, another challenge might be coping with some limited resources and dealing with referral and follow-up issues. And of course, uh, you must be very familiar with uh, wait lists. That could be another barrier. Um, you might be struggling with a youth who hasn't been attending school or is really struggling and you are waiting for supports. Um, so it can be such a challenge when you feel like you're in this stagnant position of you uh, might feel helpless. So what we are hoping that some of the tools and some of the skills that we've uh, brought you with today can at least help nudge 
you know, that stagnant feeling and maybe give you the confidence to feel that you can move forward, that you do have a lot of these skills uh, within reach that you can I mean, access. Another question and also a I mean, comment that I just wanted to uh, speak to. Um, somebody uh, chimed in. Thank you very much. Student success EAs could do that. And they're referring to the question about the mediation. And uh, absolutely, I actually feel quite horrible that I didn't mention our educational assistants uh, because they do this problem solving all day long with our students and they're very equipped to do so. So uh, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, and the, quest, the next question is how do you advocate for a student who has mental illness when the educators are unfamiliar with how the illness manifests itself? Okay. okay, so, oh, okay, we I still see you, Patty. Selene is going to answer yeah, while I get great. back on here. I think uh, when we have a student who, um, for any student who needs to be advocated for, it's really important to, to always have that student in, in, as the focus. So um, when you have education, as sort of the focal point of the, what the institution is all about. Um, and then we have, um, we layer in, you know, all the, these other variables such as mental illness. I think it's important to think, um, what's our goal? Um, does it really matter whatever labels have been given this child? Does it really matter? Um, how does this child best learn? How does this child uh, best show, demonstrate success within the classroom? Um, Patty and I often strip labels off um, that th does, those don't really help change how we're going to treat the child because if a child needs to be in a classroom, in the back of a class, go into the class earlier before the rest of the class so that way they can feel comfortable, their diagnosis may have been anxiety and they struggle with depression and perhaps even some suicidal ideation, but how they um, best succeed in that environment, I think we need to tailor to what's best for them. So working with educators on let's make this the most positive environment for this person and that happens by communicating with the family, with the youth and really addressing where um, where they see their success for themselves too. Uh, the word symptomology comes to mind. Yeah, um, so we really want to be understanding uh, maybe what's going on, um, what the underlying issues are, but not getting stuck altogether in the labels. I would totally agree with that. So I know our clock is ticking here. So I know our clock. And we're just coming up to an end. So I would encourage anyone to um, ask their questions if they would like um, while Selena is just finishing up her slides. Well, as we sit and wait for questions, I just want to say this awesome quote that we have here from Socrates uh, regarding uh, education and how is the kindling of a flame and not the filling of a vessel. Um, so just reminders that, you know, this is a this is a period of your child's life uh, that we hope can be meaningful for them, um, but we know it can be a challenge and that we it's not the be all and end all, that this is just the starting of something for them. And, you know, not to get not to let these kids just get so caught up in how um, this is such a barrier for them that we want to break down those barriers for them and help them move forward in the best way possible. So by success in school, we don't mean getting straight A's. It's more about having them attend with consistency and navigate the social elements without feeling overwhelmed with anxiety. Because uh, school's not everyone's favorite place. It's the hope that we hope that it could be safe. Uh, a space for a positive learning experience and that we hope that educational experience can be a starting point for these youth so they can venture into adulthood and essentially choose their own path. I just wanted to highlight that we just got a comment from one of our viewers um, in talking about the homeschool relationship. So um, I think that is where the homeschool relationship is so key because as a parent of a struggling student, voice those concerns. Let the school know of any resources you know that could help educate them. So absolutely, again, parents are the best advocates oftentimes for their child. 
So if you do have extra information that could be helpful to the school, or even you have a whole list of things that work for that child, definitely share those resources with your school. Okay, I think we are coming to an end of our time. To uh, looking for questions or comments. Uh, what is our favorite book for families? Well, I, I'm more of a website person. Um, I do like books and I like new, you know, journal articles. But um, that is a really, really difficult ooh. question. I'm going away. Really tough now. one. Um, there's so many great books out there, but I would really yeah. try and focus on anything that is really strength based. We truly believe and have experienced that people don't make changes unless they're feeling empowered to do so. So it's really important. Whatever you're reading. So um, gives really you a strength based approach to um, yes. navigating this school world. Navigate. Sorry, I can't be more specific. So yeah. I have to so think about But I think that we'll take that question and run with it and on our website start building more of a resource um, of linkages for families that are, you know, evidence based and um, you know, great resources for families to access and that are user friendly and that aren't heavily laden with clinical terms that we really don't want to spend the time navigating and using a dictionary to see what they mean. Just some real basic um, self-help skills, family supports, just, you know, stuff for us to read and, and definitely move things guys forward. Have any ideas, let us know. We look to you for your answers too. We look to you for all right, so I think that's a wrap, and um, we hope that uh, you, you were able to take something away from this, and um, this will be uploaded to the Your Space site, so for future reference, if you need to, you know, watch again or look up what the resources are, and we will build a resource section and, you know, offer some local resources and, um, you know, Canadian-based uh, websites that can, you know, thank be supportive you. for you. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name, I'm Selena. I'm at Linwood Charlton Center, and we have Patty. And thank you again for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you both so much. That was uh, really helpful. I think that uh, all the comments and questions let us know this is an important topic for families and uh, we'll make sure to keep building that website and uh, and thank you very much for the uh, the lovely comments for our facilitators uh, thank you Patty thank you Selena and thank you to all of you families for coming and participating and uh, please do let other other people you know um, uh, know about these sessions and the website and uh, we're really excited about continuing to build this so that we've got something really helpful for youth and families uh, there and available 24-7. Thank you. Good night.